so um, we are going to get just get started, even if a couple people trickle in here in the last couple minutes, um, just to make sure that we have time to um, have a little Q&A, uh, hopefully after. I'm just going to introduce um, our speaker, and um, we'll have a little um, bit of a, of a panel with experts afterwards. Um, so I'll introduce our experts who are here as well. And um, just say one or two things about why you might write a policy brief. So today's um, presentation is about how to write a policy brief, what a policy brief is. And it's partly in response to questions that we've had from both students and faculty about what is, what is a policy brief. We don't even know what that is when you're talking to us. And um, as, as director of the Purdue Policy Research Institute, I guess I should have said that's who I am, Laurel Weldon, director of the Purdue Policy Research Institute, um, one of the things we want to do is make sure that people understand the many mechanisms that there are um, for inserting their research into the policy domain. So this is one of the things that we've been talking about, and we've realized that no one knows what we're, we're talking about. So please come in. So today, um, we have Tyler Spence, who's our PPRI po postdoctoral fellow, to take us through the basics of what a um, policy brief is. Tyler is um, a PhD in aviation technology. He worked at the State Department, and he's one of our certificate students, um, a graduate certificate students in public policy. And if you're interested in the graduate certificate, or you think you have a student who might be, we have some flyers about the graduate certificates in public policy by the door. Feel free to take those for yourself or others. Um, to see if you'd be interested in pursuing a, a certificate, which is, can be pursued as part of a other, any other graduate degree alongside that. So we have Tyler, who's going to be talking in just a minute. Uh, we also have Lee Raymond, a faculty member in political science and director of the Center for the Environment in Discovery Park, um, who will be helping us field questions afterwards. Um, and also um, David Johnson, another professor, another one of my colleagues in political science, who's also appointed in industrial engineering. Um, and he also, he has his PhD from the RAND Corporation and worked in the RAND Corporation for many years, so he will have lots of things to say and a very distinctive um, perspective on how one might write a policy brief that comes from that background as well. So quite different backgrounds. I'm a social scientist as well and I focus on women in politics and violence against women and I can also answer questions from that regard. So um, I'm going to just let Tyler uh, take it away here and I will just say that I'm particularly grateful for Tyler presenting today under the circumstances he's suffering from the Black Plague which has been going around <laughs> campus as you know and nevertheless has dragged himself. He's so committed to um, teaching everybody about policy um, that he has come um, under pain of death here to um, <laughs> share his infinite wisdom with us today and so um, I think that I'm personally very grateful and I hope that you'll appreciate the, uh, the passion that he's bringing to his presentation even though his passion might be a little bit dampened by the black plate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, well, uh, yeah, good morning. So um, I'm going to talk to you briefly for about probably the next half hour or so um, before we get into some uh, discussion and then hopefully some questions at the end. Um, just going over what is a policy brief, talking a little bit about how, you know, getting, getting started in thinking about what is a policy brief and how, and how you're actually going to um, write this document if you just, you know, once you decide you actually have something to say that you need to get out there to certain people. Um, and that's based on your research and, and getting, presenting it in a format that's not in a, a strictly academic you know, journal article or other um, you know, ivory tower uh, you know, location. Um, so you know, this is more for presenting to people that are, you know, that are busy with, with uh, um, you know, a, a lot of things in a, in a particular topic, you know, whether it's a CEO of a company, it could be a, government official, it could be, you know, policy can, can be implemented in a lot of places. And so we'll go through some of those as we go through this uh, presentation. So, you know, when you're, you know, as we go through today, we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit about what is the policy brief, who are your readers, you know, what I was talking about, you know, who's going to, who you're actually trying to distribute this document to, uh, defining the policy actors, and then choosing the content for your policy brief. Um, so, the policy brief is a short document that's distilled from other, from larger data such as, you know, research that you're conducting. If you have something specific, there's a specific point that you want to make, that you want to emphasize from a lot of research that you've been doing that's really relevant to certain policy actors. Um, you know, you really want to create a concise document that you can give to, give to these policy actors that they can just read through quickly and get an idea of what you're saying and really understand the implications of, you know, of your research in a way that's not requiring a, you know, PhD level expertise or a very specific skill set um, in, a, in a field of knowledge. Um, so that means that this document should be jargon free. 
and you know you really want to explore explore the issue, but in a very narrow and concise way. Um, you know, and then at the end, you're really going to present the lessons that you've learned, and that's really what's emphasized in this document is. You know, you're going to have, it's going to look, it's going to be formatted much like a journal article. You're going to have your traditional introduction, your methods, your, you know, your research. But really, it's going to be boiled down into a nice 1,500 word document that's, you know, two to four pages. Um, and it's going, to, and it's really going to be standalone from, you know, all your other research that's really emphasizing that one particular point that you're really trying to get out to the policy actors. Um, so... When you start, you know, you really have to think about, you know, who's going to be reading the document that you're writing. Uh, for instance, are you trying to give this to a uh, congressman who's dealing with, you know, issues from, you know, from their constituents, you know, covering basically every issue, you know, under the earth that they're trying to solve. And so they don't have time to actually become full experts in the field, and they're relying on your knowledge to to be able to present them to them the most important points that you want that you know and that you've discovered in a, in a way that they can easily understand and then present to, to their colleagues and their constituents as well so that they can you know, uh, emphasize the importance that, that you know is, is to be true that, um, you know, that they, uh, about this issue. And so, you know, so the knowledge that, that, the, um, that your readers are gonna have about a topic, can, you know, if you're giving it to a corporation or a CEO on a very specific issue that you know they're passionate about, they might have a very, you know, they might be knowledgeable in the area uh, in a way that's different from, you know, a policymaker in the state or local or federal government um, who's dealing with a wide variety of issues. So you really have to think about who you're presenting this article to that you're writing, and that's going to shape how much information you need to focus on in your introduction and back and how much background you really need to emphasize when you're writing your document. Um, and so then, and then also, you know, you need to think about how open they are to your message. Uh, if they're, um, because, you know, if you're writing something that, let's say, you know, a contentious topic today, if you're writing about climate change and you're trying to give it to Donald Trump, you know, that may or may not be as effective as giving it to another outlet. Um, and so, you know, no matter how robust your findings are or how, you know, important you believe the issue is, if people aren't going to receive what you're writing, then you know, in essence, you may be just wasting your time writing the document in the first place. So you really need to think about, you know, understanding who your readers are and what, you, what you're actually trying to write are the two most important things when you're writing this, this policy brief. Um, so getting into a little bit about, about who actually these policy actors are, there's, you know, when we, when we say policy in, you know, when you think about political science or you think about um, the word policy, generally people just immediately go to government. And you're saying, oh, you're going to, you know, contact your congressman, or you're going to be involved in in a, a local government, you know, state government, um, those sorts of things. But policy, in general, is much more broad, and so the policy actors can cover really any aspect of people who are just trying to define policy. And so that policy can be something at a local organization. Um, you know, every, every company has to create standards and policies for how they treat their employees, how employees work, and, um, you know, uh, in, you know non-governmental organizations have policies that they're trying to, um, you know, use to help society, uh, citizens, you know, there's, um, and then, of course, the government has, has policies that actually regulate uh, standards and, and those sorts of things for, um, you know, in the more traditional sense of, you know, when you just generically think of policy. But really, policy can cover any various number of subjects, any various number of topics, any various number of, of uh, people. Um, and so, you know, so really, w when you think about policy, it's really just getting your message to somebody else who's trying to impact change on another subject. Um, and, so, and so, you know, this can be, uh, you know, it can be even loosely or very tightly organized. If you are just trying to present to a, uh, a group of, of local community actors who are trying to, you know, build a neighborhood watch, you know, that could be a policy. And, or you could be very formal and actually go to your congressman and say, we need to enact this particular legislation. So, you know, that's just, you know, all this is just to say, you know, don't get caught up on thinking that I have to send something to government when I'm writing a policy brief. 
or that you know, I have to create something that's going to be a regulation that everybody that's that's going to change society. You know, that's not the case. Yeah, you, know, you know, you just need to have an opinion. You know, have have an opinion or um, you know, evidence-based research on a particular topic that you can change some that you need to pre present to somebody that can change a particular um, you know a, or inform a particular person on you know a way you know things are act are a way people are way something is is happening um, and so um, so once you you know understand who your readers are you understand what poli you know who your policy actors are in, in your in your field in your uh, in your topic um, you know how do you reach them and so you know you what's it's better to have a topic that's more urgent than something that's going to happen, you know, either in, you know, maybe not at all, or you know, 50 years down the road. If you're, you know, really trying to get a concise document to somebody and say this is important, I've discovered this, and this is how this will improve your organization, this will improve society, you know, this is what you need to do, and then it really needs to have that 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 biting, you know, urge that says, yes, this is really important, and it'll relate to other people so that they take what you're saying to heart and actually, and actually uh, use it. And, um, and then in addition to that, you, know, you, you have to be clear about you know, what are the advantages or the benefits of what you're proposing and what, you've under, what you understand in the topic. Um, so that requires you to be a little persuasive, which we'll get into when we actually talk a little more a little bit about, about writing, actually writing the document itself. Um, so, you know, before you actually start writing something, as I've saying, you need to have that specific that specific to uh, topic that's um, you know more narrow than broad, and it needs to be a very you know a single you know thinking about a single topic, and so you know when you when you've done a lot of research, you might have you know a lot you want to say about that topic, and you're very knowledgeable about it. So, so you can write, you know, you've already, if you've already written a 30-page journal article or you've written several journal articles about it, now, you know, you know you can start talking and, and be very long-winded and, you know, think it's really important, all this stuff you want to say, but you're just, but then you have to go back and think about, you know, okay, my reader really wants to know this one particular thing. And so, you know, this is an important issue and I want to give that, get that across. So you pick that one specific topic and you're going to write that, that two to four page paper outlining the importance of that topic. And so that's, so that's really what you when, you're, you, when you keep in mind, defining that purpose you know, will keep you on track as you write through that article. Um, you know, as you identify the important points, uh, then you know, you're going to pick several important points that relate to that goal you know, that's related to that purpose. Um, and you know, once you have that outline, you've basically got your two, two to four page paper right there. Um, and so it'll be, like I said, it'll be limited to around 1,500 words. So you really don't want to get too caught up in thinking, you know, we're going to save the world, we're going to, you know, save the whales in this one document. If you have a lot of information you really want to say, you know, you can write two or three or four, have a series of policy briefs that are on this topic. And now you have a well, a well-rounded, you know, series that um, can be used as a workshop, that can be used to um, bring the, bring you know, all the policy actors in a particular field together, um, you know, that's relatable, that's using jargon-free terms, um, and it'll help. And now there's a clear picture of your topic through this series of policy briefs. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about, about formatting and actually writing your, your policy brief. I'm not going to get too much into the, to the you know, nitty-gritty about, about, you know, words you choose and, and um, you know, most of, I'm sure most of you are, are you know, experts in writing and, and know a lot about writing, so I don't want to get too caught up in that, but just a little about, about the overview of a formatting of the article. And it's going to look, <coughs> excuse me, it's, like I said, it's going to look much more, much like your technical writing that you already do. You're going to have, you know, your abstract or your summary, your introduction, um, <coughs> the methods and results that you use, um, a conclusion, and then at the end, you're going to wrap it all up with your impl implications and recommendations on, um, on how to proceed with this topic. Um, so this executive summary is much like the abstract. You know, it's going to be a short, concise statement that outlines you know, what you're writing, why it's important, um, what you did, 
and um, it's gonna and it's gonna catch the reader so that they actually dive into your your two to four page paper to actually understand some of the more background um, and some of the more specific details about the about what you're presenting. <clears throat> Just like the abstract, generally you're gonna you know write it last after you've written everything and know exactly what you've what you've said. Um, you know have those, those important details in your mind so then you can take you know take those out and put them in a concise. Uh, you know, just a little paragraph at the front. Um, so it'll be written last and appear first. Um, you know, as you, then as you get into your introduction, which outlines the why of what you're writing, um, you know, you're gonna give a little bit of background about, about, the, about the, the topic that you're writing. You know, again, thinking about the reader, how much knowledge do they, how much previous knowledge do they have? Um, are you trying to give them a general overview of a particular topic, or are you really highlighting a specific uh, point that's, that's just advancing knowledge that they might already be familiar with. <clears throat> and they're going to explain the issues of and you know, why the topic is important, why you're, why you're spending your time to write this to really get it to your readers. Um, and, then, you know, and then also, and then finally in that first you know, introductory paragraph, you just want that over, you know, again, that overview of the findings and conclusions so that it keeps them interested to, to find out more. Um, you know, again, you're you're giving this document to somebody who's busy with a lot of things. They're not academic. They might not they might not really be you know, adept in, in academic lingo or academic terminology. And you know, using terms like you know, if you get get into you know talking about statistical significance and other things like that, it might get you know get them lost. So you really want to keep them enticed um, <coughs> and keep them curious to get through the brief to really get to the important part of your of what you're trying to say, which is you know, this is what I found, and at the end, here's what I'm recommending, and here are the implications if you don't do, if, you know, you don't do what I'm recommending. Um, so <clears throat> then as we get into the approaches and research, you know, this is outlining the method, basically, and your results. Um, you know, you're going to explain you know, how your study was conducted, what you did a little bit. Uh, just, you know, again, describe your relevant background that's important to uh, conducting your study. And, um, and really, then you're just going to provide a brief summary and um, of the facts that you've that you've uncovered, you know, in your in your results section. Um, you know, when we'll get into actually having supplemental background information like some tables and figures. Um, and you know, as you write your results, you want to make sure that the content's really easy to follow. You don't want the you know the super long table. You know, that's going to take up a page already. And you only have two to four to begin with, so you really, you know, you can't have your super long table with your 36 variables and you know all your little stars and asterisks that show that they're all super significant um, <coughs> and all that stuff. Um, and so, you know, because that's and that again, that's you know, thinking about your readers, that's not really important to them. They want to, okay, so that's great. So why why are you showing me this? Um, you know, make sure the analysis is is complete, but not super technical. Um, so you're going to start with that general picture and then move to more specifics as you really highlight you know, the really important parts that they need to be familiar with. Um, and then as we get into, you know, again, as we get to the conclusions, the conclusions be, should be specifically related to what you're presenting in your results. Again, keeping in mind that you're just presenting the results that are related to the very specific topic, related to the very specific idea that you want to propose to this person. Um, so again, it's all very narrow, very short. Um, and then, you know, once you and then drawing those conclusions, you're going to you know interpret the data again, much like you do in your journal articles, and um, and then and really, but really make those those conclusions concrete. You're going to make them more, you know, you're really trying to emphasize your points. So you're going to make them more, you know, on the you know where you might you know in your journal article you might be you know less aggressive in making a certain claim because you know that somebody's going to you know counter that claim or, or say that you know well you know this. You know, there's there's rooms for for um, you know you, um, contention or or um, you know things like that. But um, you know you really want to be more strong when you're presenting your your policy brief because you're you're trying to get your point across and you're you only have that two to four page paper to say this is an important issue. I'm spending my time showing you that I've collected all this information. I have this you know this data that supports this evidence, and I you know and you need to understand that. Um, and so you're, you know, of course, you want your ideas that are, you know, balanced and defensible, and but you know, you're going to, you know, you're you're really making an argument that, you know, this is important. You need to know this, and this is why. 
So that leads to really the, you know, after you've, you've shown that, you know, you have, you've said this, you know, you've made your case that this is a really strong, you know, argument, you need to listen to me, like you, you have um, this evidence, then, you know, then you get into your implications and recommendations, where implications are what could happen. You're going to say, okay, this is the track we're on, so if, you know, and this is what could happen if we don't, you know, if we stay on the course or if we don't make any changes. And then your recommendations are what you're saying, okay, so this is, what, this is where we're going or, you know, right now on the current course. Here's all my evidence that supports that this is going to happen, and here's my recommendation that either we need to change this or we need to pursue this other path. And, um, you know, and again, it's going to flow from the top of your do document all the way down in a logical manner so that um, your conclusions then just naturally flow right into your implica implications and recommendations. Um, as I mentioned, the implications are, you know, showing what could happen, um, you know, describing, you know, some consequences. Um, as I'm, you know, they're going to be less direct than recommendations because, again, it's that, that what could happen. You know, you're not trying to say, you know, the, you know, the world's going to, the world's going to end if we, you know, if we keep, stay the course, although it could maybe. But, um, again, you're, you're, you know, it's just, you're making some projections as, again, re really reinforcing why the policy position you're advocating is important. Um, you know, it's going to be softer, but if you have the, the evidence to support the implication, it's going to make sense and really, and really emphasize that, um, you know, it's important and you're still going to be persuasive, which leads to your recommendation saying, okay, this all, we laid all this, you know, this groundwork here. Now, if we, you know, and the evidence shows that if we, we make this change or we do this and we have these recommendations, now these changes are going to happen and we're going to get back on track or we're going to make progress in this area or, um, you know, whatever it is related to your topic that you're recommending. And so this is where you need to make sure you're, you're really clear in your recommendations. You know, you just don't, you don't want to have um, open-ended recommendations that just say, you know, um, you know we're going to be, um, you know, happier as a whole or, or, you know, something like that. You really want to be specific so that way when they, the, poli you know, the people that you're, you're giving this to say, okay, this is the exact change that, you know, there's all this evidence the supports, we make this change, and thi you know, this is going to happen, um, and it's going to get us on that track. Um, and so you know, it's going to be stated as, as precise steps. It's going to be very, you know, very clear what you should do. And again, it's going to be related to your evidence so that it's relevant and credible. Um, and then also, make sure, you know, and then also, of course, it needs to be feasible because you don't want to say, okay, if we invest, you know, $600 trillion into this, then we can, you know, feed everybody on the planet and everybody's going to be happy and, you know, all that, you know, it's needs to be realistic and feasible for the people that you're presenting it to, um, and it needs to be based on the evidence that you found, you know, on, in um, whatever your research is that you're doing. Um, so now just getting, shifting stages here, just thinking about how you're actually going to present that look of the, of the, um, of the policy brief. Um, so you can have, you're going to have this, this, you know, document that's going to be two to four pages of, of text. But again, when you're thinking about your readers, if you just, you know, if you if you're going to give it to, um, you know, somebody to to glance at and read through on their own time, that's, um, you know, and you're advocating, you know, you're going out of your way to write this document for somebody that you want to to implement something to make a difference. So, it not only needs to be persuasive on your end, then it needs to, you know, catch their eye and make them want to keep reading. So, of course, you have to think about uh, simple things like. You know, what's the title of your of your policy brief? You know, how does how does it look? Is it just a, a four page document of you know ten point font text that's just you know one giant long paragraph, um, and or are you you know and oh, a good <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you know so ha so thinking about the these formatting issues and these designing issues are also important. Um, you know, your your titles. You know, just like you know with a lot of you know. Things you write, you want your title to be, you know, at least you know to have to tell you the information that you know the the point of your your article, um, you know, ha be interesting so that they keep reading, um, and then um, and you can have some some subtitles, but you know you don't want them to be too long so that you're just the whole document's just a title or that you know um, you know you want it to grab the reader's attention, um, and then as you go through your document, 
there might be some specific points that you really want to emphasize. And so you can really pull those out and highlight that in some sort of sidebar or a call out um, where you can you know, print something in a larger font on the side or you can um, you know, have, a, have a hook um, that really you know, draws the reader's attention to you know, this is really the crux of what I'm trying to say in this. It's one, if I'm going to make this one sentence summary of what, of what you know, I'm trying to say, here it is. Um, and then, you know, and then of course, you, ha you know, in the, in the text, you'll have, you know, more explanation. Um, and, um, you know, and something to think about, you know, it's also your sidebars, if you, you know, pull something out, you know, focus on action. And so, you know, when, you, when you're, uh, you know, if you have a specific, um, you know, do item that, or a specific point that's going, you know, that's really emphasizing the, you know, the critical nature of your topic, something that's, you know, that, that's an easy reference uh, item if, you know, if, if you're writing for, uh, you know, if, if the person you're writing for is going to present this to their board of, of whoever, you know, they can refer to that specific comment and say, you know, in, you know, 2017, you know, 230,000 people are going to be, you know, affected with some disease or, or something, you know, that's related to whatever your topic is that um, is an easy, that's an easy hook, an easy uh, point of reference that really makes your, your policy brief relevant. Um, and so, um, you know, thinking about how you want to do that, um, you know, just having a bulleted list um, may or may not look very attractive. You know, if you do need some bullets, um, you know, you definitely don't want more than seven, even that's probably generous. Um, you know, you're going to just want to, you know, if you're a two to four page paper, if you have a, you know, nine point bulleted list, you know, now you don't have any text and you just have some bullet points. Um, and, um, so, you know, think, just thinking about small things like that where, you know, as you're right, you know, we, we know you all know the topic. We know, you know, you're very, you're excited about the topic, but, you know, it's really just getting back to that reader and, you know, you know, what's the action, you know, what, what are you recommending? You know, what's your policy that you're, you're trying to get changed and, or, or inform people about? Um, and, you know, who's reading this? Um, and... Um, and so then that gets into using a few graphics. Again, this is going to, you know, eat up the text that you can write your, you know, writing your, your, your second dissertation or third dissertation or whatever. And, um, you know, and really making you think about, you know, presenting the information in a concise and clear way. Um, so using some, some pie charts or bar graphs can be very, can tell a lot of information in a little space. Um, you know, you want to make sure that, that you don't, it's, it's not all numbers and text, but that the, the you know, you're, if you're using a bar graph, that your bars are very clear, that it's easy to reference, you know, what exactly you're trying to, to tell in the, in the picture. Um, and, um, you know, and these kinds of graphs can be more interesting than just publishing a table, which is, you know, more words in just a box. And, but if you have a picture, then, you know, you can really emphasize percentages, numbers, you know, all, all sorts of things um, in a neatly designed, uh, you know, graphic. Um, and then, of course, you know, if, if necessary, you can use a, a short subtitle and short content under the graphic to really explain what's going on. Um, but again, you don't want the, the, your, your description of your, of your chart to be longer than the paragraphs in your text. Um, and it's really just, you know, your graphics are really just going to help the reader simplify the, and understand what's, what you're actually presenting in your, in your argument. Um, so once you have your, your, um, your document, you know, drafted, of course, you know, you don't want to forget to proofread. Uh, you know, that's, we all, you know, even after, re you know, giving it to a million people, you still find, you know, some, something. There's always, you know, there's always a way to improve it. So, you know, you, of course, you don't want to make sure that it's, you know, get caught so caught up in making sure that it's perfect that you never actually give it to your the people that you're trying to give it to. Um, but you do make sure want <laughs> to make sure you don't have any you know glaring errors that that <clears throat> that get the reader caught up in you know looking at looking for more errors in your paper um, instead of actually reading what you're writing. Um, you know, again, you're going to try to make it um, user friendly. Really think about the content, um, who you're writing it for. They're not necessarily experts in the field. They're not, you know, they don't have the, the um, necessarily higher education, higher, you know, um, background that, um, that, that you might have. Um, and also it should lead, you know, it should be open to um, allowing for some questions and answers that, you know, it should, you know, be easily relatable that they, if they have, 
you know, it forms a question and that, that can help them you know, engage in a dialogue, which can in some ways even be more important than the actual document itself is starting that conversation um, and allowing for questions. And then of course, you know, once you get into the questions, now you have the opportunity to actually expand on more details in your research, um, you know, really emphasize other points that, that you may wanna say, but you're, you're not saying in that particular document. Um, and it can lead, and it may lead to, like I said, that, that series, that next series of briefs. It may give you um, an opportunity to actually engage with other policymakers um, on that topic who you aren't reaching out to yet, but who they know. And now all of a sudden, you have all the policymakers that you wanted that you wanted to meet in the first place in the same room. Um, so you know, thinking about which is exactly leading into you know distributing this document once you have it written. You know, who, you know, who are you getting it to, and how do you get it to them? Um, so obviously you don't just want to send it to uh, the general email on a website for a company and say, oh, I have this policy brief, you all need to do this, and I think it's great. You know, I don't think that'll get you very far. Um, but you know, at the same, and at the same time, you know, sending your policy brief directly to President Trump might not get as far either. Um, and so you know, thinking about in the middle, um, you know, who's actually going to read it and who can use it most effectively um, is really you know, what you want to ask yourself and, and that's who you want to target. Um, so that can be, you know, that, that, but that, that can be, you know, in some cases that could be the, the, the president of an of a organization. Um, if you have a direct relationship with them, you've, you've already engaged with them and know that they're, they're really struggling with a particular topic. Um, but at the same time, it could just be somebody who's actually behind this, more behind the scenes um, and but has the, the ear and is actually the one who's you know ultimately making um, and informing people on the issues. Um, so you know and so and of course the um, you know so actually so establishing that that who you want to send to um, is particularly important when you're um, after you you know once you finalize your document and you need to um, you know who needs to read it uh, in general and then finding that specific person that can help you distribute that information. Um, is is important to consider, um, and you know, having that establishing that personal relationship can really help you get through the door because um, they know they have contacts, and um, and then it'll help you build the rapport so that um, you know they they trust you. And when you say, hey, I have you know I've discovered this, and you know I've written this this short document, you know it's not going to take so much time. It's going to be very clear and concise. You know they know that that they can rely on you, and they'll you know pick it up and you know maybe in you know 15 minutes or 20 minutes they've read your document and now they have the knowledge to go and either recommend that you know recommend it to somebody else or put you in contact with other people um, so you know if you send it to them it doesn't hurt to you know follow up once you've um, you know distributed the document once you know you want to make sure that um, you know that they actually you know are keeping on top of it because it's easy to accept the document and say hey, I'll get to this later and then you know a month down the road or two months down the road they're you know it's still in their list of, of things at the bottom of the pile and so you know just you know if, you, if you've built that rapport then it's easier for you to to call them up and just hey I'm just you know we're you know if you want to grab a coffee or something or you know re go you know just making sure what's you know and it's a lot easier to to actually you know Get your get your point you know across and what you're trying to say and make sure that that you're actually going to have some make some inroads in in you know the ultimate goal which is you know getting your your policy uh, recommendations distributed and disseminated to the people that need to know it um, and then you know along the same lines you know a lot not only with you know writing your document um, but uh, after you've written that document, you know, being proactive throughout the whole process is really important. Being proactive about being clear and concise, um, really engaging on, your, on the point of your topic. And then afterwards, you know, you've written your policy brief, you say these are recommendations that they need to make, uh, that, or that, yeah, that we need to make and changes that we need to make. And then if you just let it go, then maybe those changes really weren't that important to begin with. But if you're really passionate about that topic and really think that these, these changes, you know, like I said, if you're leading to a series of policy briefs on a topic, or um, you know, and you need to keep engaged um, if it's you know as critical as you think it is, um, or believe it is. Um, and so you know, seeking out opportunities to work with policy actors, you know, establishing those communications, um, you know, maybe ultimately holding a seminar or a, or a workshop on a variety of 
on the topic that you're that you're discussing. Um, you know, it not only will it will it hopefully help the the policy actors you know become more informed. It also you know as a, as a side benefit then you know um, increases your your availability and and it and it um, and when people think of that topic, now they know that you're the expert in that field, and they're more likely to come to you, and then you can actually get even more detailed about you know, the research that you've done and the experiences that you know um, about that topic. So in the end, you know, you're going to you know, want to seize those opportunities when, they're, when, they, uh, uh, when they happen. Um, you know, and you can do this by you know having copies of your policy brief. If you just carry around the you know a short that short two to four page document and uh, fold it up, we have some of those at P, you know, PPRI. I don't I don't think we brought any, um, but we you know we have the some of the policy briefs um, that are just the they're on our website. The, they're on the website, yeah. Um, and um, you know just having them when you go to meetings, you can present them to people, um, and. Um, of course, you know using social media helps when you uh, to distribute in today's world, um, and then just getting into how you know just yeah talking about the PPRI website. Um, it's a little complicated. We're trying to work on that uh, currently, but right now, if you just go to our main web page, you know at PPRI, um, you can see our current policy briefs that we have stored in the in the libraries. Um, we have our policy brief link. Um, we have it set up right now so that it's set up with the Discovery Park strategic themes um, and then their, the five focus areas. So if you click on one of the, our three strategic team themes, um, then it, in each category there's our five focus areas um, and that leads to the actual policy briefs in each area. Um, and then just finally, um, here's some other, just, I just wanted to just highlight some particular references. Uh, John Hopkins School of Public Health has a, some excellent resources on actually writing policy briefs for, um, and some documents. Um, and then you know, there are other uh, good sources online that, that are available to help um, when talking about, when thinking about how to write your policy briefs. We're recording this, so that's why we have the uh, microphone. So uh, this little handout that we have um, gives, uh, just provides a sort of a brief what, why, and how for policy briefs for you to take with you to kind of expands on some things that Tyler said and is more brief about others, but sl maybe a sl slightly different take. Um, but what I wanted to do now was um, invite Lee and David to chime in about anything that they might want to say to kind of say, oh, well, this is a little different, or I, we did this a little differently, um, or in my experience, we do this differently, or to amplify something you think is particularly important, or do you, and then um, we'll just take some questions if there's anything from the audience. Do you want to start, David, or Lee? Either one. Okay, go ahead. Sure. sure. Okay, um, so I can briefly just kind of tack on two points. Uh, one related to kind of thinking through the implications, because when I was working at uh, the Rand Corporation, we often uh, see ourselves as providing decision support for policymakers or decision makers in an organization. And so uh, oftentimes the policy briefs that you might be producing may be less persuasive and more just kind of walking through all of the implications. So in some contexts, depending on whether or not decision makers are actively looking for recommendations, you might be pushing that very hard. But in other contexts, you may be just kind of walking through the implications and not necessarily advocating for any particular solution, uh, just depending on your topic. Uh, so that's something to kind of be aware of and goes back to knowing who your audience is as to whether or not they are kind of looking for recommendations or if they're just looking for um, kind of strong analytic support to think through the situation in order for them to reach their own decision. And so in that instance, then your job as the, the brief writer is to kind of present all the information in a clear and concise way, uh, but not necessarily to advocate for any particular decision being made. 
Um, the other point that I was going to kind of tack on to that Tyler talked about was related to the graphics and figures that you might be producing. Because oftentimes these briefs would be based on a journal article that you've written or some sort of other uh, material that you've already produced. And just like when you're adapting a paper that you've written for a presentation at a conference, oftentimes the figures that you want to include in a policy brief are different than the figures that you have in your paper, right? Because your journal article is something that people are going to sit down with, they're going to be curled up in front of the fireplace mm -hmm. and have, you know, 20 minutes that they can look at a very complex figure if they need to and puzzle it out, right? In a journal article, your figures are often very dense with information and take a long time to kind of unspool and, and comprehend. So resist the urge to just copy and paste a figure into your policy brief and say, okay, I'm presenting all the information, here it is. Um, you again have to think about who your audience is, how technically sophisticated they are, and whether or not you know your policymaker that's going to be reading this, they might may, may not know what a confidence bar is, or you know, so you might need to adapt and simplify your figures, just like how in a conference presentation you might need to kind of provide some sort of a sequential build that kind of allows you to talk through it. Um, for figures for a policy brief, it may just be kind of removing some of the information or stripping out, again, distilling the key ideas and the, the key data that you need to present in that figure in order to get your point across instead of giving something that's super complicated and would take a long time to talk through. Okay. Lee? Okay. Oh. Thanks, David. Um, I would echo a lot, actually not even a lot, everything that David said <laughs> and, and virtually everything that Tyler said, nice job, Tyler. That was great. Um, I'll just amplify a couple things and then and then ride a couple of hobby horses that I have in this area that I think are helpful. And then, but I'll try to be brief. So the first is, yeah, much like what David was saying. And I'm not trying to trip Tyler up, but he, but even he fell into what I think is the trap here, which is he said, right, you should format this like a journal article. I think that's really not right. You might want to do that, but typically, actually, you probably don't want to do that. And if you are going to have a method section, boy, is that going to be short, right? People do not want to read lengthy discourses in a policy brief, right, on where this data came from and how you did the analysis. You need to, there is where you need to give them, right, access to the, again, hopefully peer-reviewed or some other research, right, that you've published that is that detailed version, right, so they can get that. So in a way, your policy brief, right, is an advertisement for your science. You're not going to get all the science in the policy brief, and if you did, you just wrote your journal article again. So don't do that, right? And, and so if you're having high anxiety about not giving all those key details, the key is to be able to figure out what's the message here, right? And if I've gotten you interested enough that you want to go now look at write my journal article, even better. Okay, so that's just one quick thing. In addition on that point, uh, uh, many of the policy briefs that I've written are not about a specific article. In fact, most of them are not. They're often more almost like a prim primer or just summarizing some really key misunderstood points on an issue, right, that um, you have a better grasp of, than, and you're actually doing a huge service, right, by just giving people a much clearer statement. So some of the things that I've worked on, a lot of what I do is um, emissions trading. So there's tremendous misinformation about even what an emissions trading policy is, how they work, what they do do, what they don't do, right? So a lot of, um, going back to, to David's discussion about a lot of what I'm just trying to do in writing policy briefs in that area is just at least make sure that, look, you can have whatever opinion you want, right, but let's at least agree on some of the basic facts about what we know, right, about how these policies do or don't work. Um, okay, I'm going too long here. So really quick comment. Something that comes up a lot that we haven't mentioned at all so far is this issue of kind of neutrality or sort of a nonpartisan voice. Um, this is a complicated issue. I think people oversimplify it on both sides. I would just urge that in general, I think David's comments are right. When in doubt, opt for being more neutral. Being neutral doesn't mean you don't have important things to say. It means that you're talking more in the language of, if this is what you want, then my research or the research I'm reviewing suggests that these are the things that are probably more effective in terms of accomplishing that goal. But notice that you're not necessarily telling the people what the goal is, right? Or you say, look, so the, the government has decided this is the goal, right? So I'm gonna talk about some different ways, right? That that may or may not be successfully achieved. But you're not saying, here's what the goal should be. Or if you are saying that, you're saying that in a very different way, right? Where you have some evidence to make that argument. So that's important and easy to lose track of. And that brings me to my third and really probably final point. Um, so 
there's some ambiguity about a policy brief versus what I would call kind of a research brief. And a lot of what I think Tyler was describing is more what I would call the research brief, although, again, this is a bit also amb ambiguous. Um, so Tyler's right. You've got to be able to articulate why is this important. But it can't just be because my science is important, because it was published in science. That is important. And you're making an important contribution to scientific knowledge. But that's not what makes it important for a policy brief, right? So you really have to be able to articulate right up front, why is this important for a pressing social problem? And again, it may be a problem that government is or is not dealing with. But if you can't articulate that, you're, then you're not really writing a policy brief, right? So at some level, you have to communicate how whatever the research that you're doing is um, what's the problem here, right? So that, that's really critical. Okay, but on the other hand, you gotta be really careful. Um, many people who write these briefs are of course scientists, right? They don't necessarily have a deep understanding of the policies that govern this problem. So a little bit of humility about really making explicit policy recommendations is really important for all of us, but it's especially important if you haven't, right, if your work is much more scientific and you aren't deeply familiar with the inner workings of the Clean Air Act, right, so you've got something that you want to say about air pollution and public health implications. That's really important for people who study the Clean Air Act, but don't then necessarily assume that you know the right way to amend the Clean Air Act, right, because that's a whole different set of questions. And I, occasionally I see my good friends and colleagues in climate science thinking that because they actually have a very good understanding of a climate science problem, they know the answer, the climate policy answer. And that's an easy thing to fall into. And especially if you were listening to some of this advice and not thinking carefully, you could get tricked by that, right? And then end your policy brief. Oh, but wait, what's my policy recommendation, right? And that can get you into a lot of trouble. So just, you, I'm sure that there are gonna be important policy implications in all the research that people here are doing. But think carefully about what those policy implications are and, and be careful about, right, overstepping into an area of, again, policy design, right, that isn't what really is your expertise, right? So you shouldn't be expected to try to take that on, right, in a policy brief. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'll end with a comment from literature on public policy theory. So the bad thing for all of this is that most of this stuff does not get read, right? The number one rule of politics is that the, scarce, the most scarce resource in politics is attention. It's a well-demonstrated fact in political science. But the good news is, is that stuff never dies. So um, another very leading political scientist has pointed out, right, that ideas come from anywhere. And so po the policy brief that you write today could end up having a profound influence on policymaking in five years, in five months, in five days, or even in 20 years, right? And you'll never know. And that's the funny thing about this system. So, okay, thanks. That's great. I want to just add two very short things before we ask put open for questions. And one follows right on from this attention question. And one question is, so how do you um, get access to that attention? How do, if you want your research to make a difference, if you want your research to have an impact, how do you get access to that attention? And one of the things to do is to not be only thinking about making a difference when you get to the end of your research. So one thing I would say is, even though this is about when you write your policy brief at the end, there's nothing preventing you from talking to people to find out what question or angle will be most interesting to them. So you might have a big research project that could be um, cut up a bunch of different ways and, and um, you know, it could be helpful for you to know before you write your policy brief, what's the most interesting aspect of this research? It's okay to have conversations with people, you know, maybe they're, um, you know, uh, non-governmental organization representatives, maybe it's a senator or, you know, a state representative or just anybody um, who, uh, a journal article, and uh, a journalist, you know, conversations with people about what they're interested in and what are the things that they really want to know. And you might think it's perfectly obvious, but actually your research might have something very useful to say that you might not be aware of. So it's very useful to have that whole communicative process even before you come up with what question and the why of it. And I also just wanted to amplify another thing that Lee said, which is that all of this sounds very hard and crazy and why would anybody do this when they're so busy being a student or, um, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, trying to get tenure or whatever it is that you're trying to do. And I wanted to say there's both self-interested and public good reasons for doing policy briefs or these kinds of communicative products that are not traditional scholarly products. And the first reason is, is this drives attention to your research. Every single one of these little um, pieces that's more digestible than your long, complicated technical journal article or book is more accessible um, and is an advertisement for your article. It's going to put your research in the hands of people who want it because 
everybody's attention is scarce, everybody's busy, you know, you're all, you know, whatever, driving your kids, you know, to school and dropping them off and trying to peel the grapes for their lunch, whatever ridiculous thing you're trying to do. And meanwhile, somebody's trying to talk to you about climate change or disaster relief or violence against women or whatever thing, it's important, but you just don't have time. If you can make it easy for them to digest, you're, you have a chance to get your toe in the door. It can be a blog post, it can be whatever, but a policy brief is one of those more digestible items, and it makes it more likely that your research will have an impact. So if you care about, you know, whether your research has an impact, this is a way to get more attention by everybody. We had an, um, somebody cite one of our articles in the New York Times, um, and, uh, and we had a lot of citations to that article, even though it was one of the top journals in my field, it got a lot more attention after we, we got cited in the New York Times, because people who are my colleagues who should be reading the top journal in my field learned about it from the New York Times. So. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that we, th we can be too rigid about um, scholarly products appearing in these scholarly outlets as the only way to get attention from our colleagues. Our colleagues, like everybody else, read the newspaper. Um, my colleague Lee Raymond also just had an op-ed in the monkey cage um, this week, last week. Um, and again, that's going to drive tremendous uh, attention to his important research. Um, so the, no, it's true. So the, um, you know, these things are very important. So that's just one thing is that there's a kind of self-interested professional goal. And the other thing is that, you know, everybody makes a big investment in each and every one of us in this room. Uh, in, at a land-grant university in, in, in Indiana, at any public university, and truthfully, truth be told, at any university really in the country, somebody's making a big investment of you. If you are a tenure-track faculty member, if you are a student, somebody is making a big investment in you being in the place that you are and having the opportunity to do research. If you've expended the resources, your personal time and energy, the resources of the institution you're in, to find out something important, you must get that information into the public sphere. So see, I'm not doing what Lee said and making it neutral <laughs> and saying, if you care about doing something right, the right thing to do is to get your research into the policy domain and make sure that that investment that's made in you um, is actually fully realized. So I think that that's a very important thing. So maybe there's a little time for questions. Did you need to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Jenny Jackson. I work for the Purdue University Press. Um, and so I was having a conversation with one of my friends that's a master's student here, and I was trying to explain to her like why I thought policy briefs and getting, and not just standard journal articles in academics were getting your information out to a more general audience was a better, was a better idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I got lot, met with a lot of um, aggression almost mm -hmm. from it. She didn't want to change her mind. She was like, we get told to do this. We get told to write journal articles. We have to write journal articles a certain way. And you can't expect the researcher to take the time to write a whole nother piece of information if they're already doing this. How do we get them to take a different avenue, take a different perspective, and take a different look? Because I tried explaining the idea of, well, getting, putting your information out there because you think it's important mm -hmm. is important. Mm -hmm. And she was just like, no, it should be the journals that do that. Mm -hmm. And that didn't make any sense to me either. Is there a way to make them think a different way or like give them ideas to look at it from a new perspective? I mean, that's a really important point, right? And you have to be very thoughtful about, especially if you're trying to get promoted, right? Journal articles or whatever, right? Every department is different, right? Every discipline is different or books or something else, right? Peer reviewed work is still the foundation, right? Of these briefs. So if you don't have that, you don't really have anything, right? So that is important, yes. but they're not exclusive. But again, if attention is really scarce for elected officials, it's probably almost as scarce, right? For academics. So that is an important concern. And I guess there I would just say that there are resources, th this is explicitly why organizations like PPRI or my own center, right, exist. So we actually have staff, right, and myself even, who will spend time, right, working with faculty to create a draft, right, of a policy brief, especially for faculty who have not done that before, right? So recognizing, right, that that is a challenge. Purdue has actually invested, right, in resources or even in the press, right, to help students or faculty, right, who, for whom this is a new way to think about, right, and, and so that would be a major undertaking, right, to help them get more comfortable with it and also help them not spend as much time, right, to, to be able to do this more efficiently. So it's a legitimate concern, but ideally they do both. And I think increasingly, Laurel's right, um, successful academics are doing both, right? It, the world is drowning in information, right? So, it, so more and more, um, yeah, it's becoming more and more important to find ways to get above that sort of noise.
My name is Roseanne Alstett, and I lead the National International Scholarships Office. When we talk to students who are, at this moment in their lives, they're learning how to dig in and do really focused research, and then we teach them how to broaden and widen the scope, and it's a really hard thing to do to toggle between those two, which is, I think, what you're talking about. We explain to them that if you want to really lead in your field, you have to be able to communicate your ideas. You have got to reach those people who are not in your field. You can get a lot of smart people in good positions that are going to fill the seats, but the ones who lead, they're the ones who are writing those policy briefs, and they're the ones who know how to do it. Be here for a few minutes if you have questions, but other than that, I want to thank you all for um, your interest and for attending today. And um, once again, we have information here at the table about how to write a policy brief, what, when, what, why, and how. I'm trying to think what questions we settled on. And um, then also, there's information about the policy certificates we offer, both the social policy certificate and the environmental policy certificate. Uh, there's information about those by the door. Rosalie Clausen, who's the chair of the Department of Political Science, is here and also can answer questions about those certificates as well. Um, so happy to uh, answer any questions afterwards. And thanks again for coming. Thanks, Kyle.